special, special welcome to all of you on the phone who have um, given so generously, philanthrop philanthropically to our childbirth um, center and our pediatrics program. We are truly and grateful to your support of our women's and children's services over the years. So a special thank you to you. Um, I'm excited to share with you the impact of your generosity. So again, do please keep yourself on mute. Um, if you're not speaking, again, that just helps our background um, noise, the way to go on and off mute up at your toolbar. There is a little um, icon that looks like a microphone and you just hit that and you'll see a slash through it and that allows you um, to go on mute. So we're gonna go ahead and get started. So for those of you who I haven't had an opportunity to meet, my name is Ann Rasmussen. I'm the Chief Development Officer um, for the Northwest, which basically just means I get to spend my days working with our community, finding out their passion, um, and then connecting them with the programs and services at Peace Health um, that, where they would like to, to make a difference. I have a hope for you today, um, and that hope is that you leave um, having a deeper understanding of the services that we provide the clinicians that will care for you, and really might um, gain a deeper understanding um, to the experience that you would have or your family members or neighbors would have um, when they visit us um, here at Peace Health St. Joseph. So we're going to go ahead and go to the next slide. Thank you, Joanna. Um, so again, my name is Ann Rasmussen, so glad to be here. I would like to um, take this opportunity um, to introduce you to um, our wonderful, wonderful speakers today. And um, the first person that I want to introduce is Kayla Torres. Kayla um, is our Peace Health Service Line Director for our Women's and Children's Program. Kayla joined Peace Health in 2019 to provide nursing leadership for our Women's and Children's Service Program. She got her start in nursing on the other coast, back in New York City, where she completed her nursing degree at Columbia University. Um, adding to her, er, her early nursing education, um, just in her spare time, she pursued her, um, she pursued her doctoral degree at Drexel um, School of Nursing in Philadelphia um, as a PA. It, um, I'm sorry, um, Pennsylvania. She additionally holds her Juris Doctorate from Fordham School of Law and a Bachelor's in Science and Finance from the University of Puerto Rico. I don't know if you sleep, Kayla. This is so, I love this. Um, and also fluent in Spanish, loves to travel and cook and passionate about health and equities and patient advocacy. So thank you. Um, and I think then what I'll do is introduce Dr. Kelly before she is up. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to you. So if we go to the next slide. Great. Well, thank you. We're really excited to uh, be in this forum and share a little bit of our story. Um, I think it's really important that we start off by what centers us, which is a focus on our mission. And at the foundation, and no pun intended, <laughs> of our work is always this uh, fundamental need to provide high quality, safe and patient-centered care for the women and children in our community and surrounding areas. That really is our guiding principle. Where we land in terms of our main focus is expanding where we're at in terms of current scope of service and really pushing ourselves to incorporate more specialized inpatient and outpatient services within our community. We think that the time is now. We really do have to do more to meet our community's evolving needs and to truly become that one-stop provider of choice in this region so that we can meet our community needs within our community and not have to go outside unless truly necessary. Can we go to the next slide? So to give you an idea of where we're, where we're at, what's, what's our current state? What do we know about it? So we know that A, we have opportunities with respect to our current physical layout with um, an expansion in, in the scope of services and, and providing more comprehensive higher acuity across the board of our women and children's um, service line that requires to have uh, a more um, up-to-date specialized layout than what we currently have. We know that we have opportunities in how we approach our prenatal and antenatal care in a way where 
that care is all provided within our community and not have to be split between what can be done here and what currently a lot of our patients have to seek elsewhere that kind of like piecing it together no we want to be able to do it all within here um right now in our nursery we have a modified level two care we are we are licensed as a level two special care nursery, but we haven't optimized that licensure to the degree that we would want as we're limited to newborns 34 weeks gestation or greater at this point. We are also um, our inpatient pedi pediatric care. We have certainly opportunities to do more with that field. And we have multiple challenges as it relates to coordinating outpatient procedures and fusion access for our patient population. In addition to that, there's a whole world within uh, women's care that is non-obstetrical related and where we have found that we have gaps in our current uh, GYN specialty non-reproductive related care. And one that has uh, really risen uh, to the the top is wanting to have a comprehensive uh, behavioral care services. We're already a community that has a need and we haven't had as much in this as we would want. And in addition to that, when it comes to the women and, and children's uh, subset of this one thing that this pandemic has shown us is how much we need to focus on there do you want me to wait for the next slide joanna we're oh there we go oh, thank there you go. thank you <laughs> so having said all that right like, i want us to focus on what is our future where do we want to go and in the middle of all this we think about our consumer and our consumer is truly our community what do we want to be able to provide? So we want to start off with having convenient sites of care. We want to bring the care to you. We don't want you to have to travel for it. We want to have collaborative specialty care. What does that mean? We want to bring the subspecialties to within our community so you don't feel like the services are piecemealed um, together. Patient navigation, that's key, right? So it can feel, especially when you're thinking about taking care of somebody through their continuum of care um, through their lifespan. How do you navigate these services in a way where you feel like you're getting what you need in real time and not um, feeling like this, it's, it's just so complicated, which is a lot of the feedback that we get. And you can't leave out of the equation a personalized aspect to it. This care should be tailored to your specific needs, not a one shoe fits all. Engaging our other community partners so that we can enhance what we have here to truly feel that both within and outside of the hospital, the needs are being met, making sure that uh, the information is readily available. And how do we measure all of this? Really going by, we talk a lot about evidence-based practice. Well, you also make sure that you have to have measurable deliverables and, and outcomes that really drive this sense of, of alignment and that we are truly doing what needs to be done. So we take a look at the next slide. Okay, so how do we bridge the gap, right? When we sat down and thought to ourselves, we know where we wanna go, now we need to develop a plan on how we're gonna get there. So one thing was formalizing our women and children's service line, really saying to people, this is who we are, this is what we're planning on doing. And then within our Peace Health family, having that roll up to our system, women and children's services plans. Uh, as I mentioned before, upgrading our current footprint is key. Uh, expanding the level of prenatal and antenatal care to include 32 plus weeks gestation is critical and aligns nicely with the plans for our special care nursery, which for this year, we really want to optimize our full licensure so that we can start keeping in-house this patient population. Another piece is reducing our migration of antenatal, neonatal, and pediatric care. This is very near and dear to this team's heart because this speaks to the fact of we want to be that place where we take care of you. You should not have to, we shouldn't have to transfer you out for things that we should be offering here. 
terms of future plans, we want to be able to expand to a level three NICU as the this we really want to be this community centered um, of insulin for women and children, and that's one key component to it. We want to work with uh, our partners, half joint ventures, where we, we can really have not just a wide range of GYN specialty services, but really think about this expansion from the standpoint of breast care, plastics, GYN onc, Euro, GYN, GYN robotics, all these things that we know that we have a subset of our women's population with this need that we're currently not uh, meeting to our full potential. Next one. Also, we have amazing pediatric and OB hospitalist programs in place that we can really take to the next level as we expand our scope of practice. And really, like when we think about our pediatric services, to have more of our patients be able to be kept here to do the outpatient uh, procedures that right now our patients are going up to Seattle to do, to maximize our relationships with uh, UW and Seattle children for the special care. Um, and really, the underlying piece to all of this is bringing the care to our community. Uh, and as I have mentioned before, a focus on comprehensive behavioral health program and also really recognize the fact that within our community, we do need to continue to support our um, minimum opioid exposure initiatives. That is part of the equality component of our care. Can we go to the next one? Okay, so I've talked a lot about where we are, where we want to go, but I really do believe that to really cement this, I want to turn this over to my partner in this work so she can really speak to the physician aspect of this and tie it into a really nice story that could bring this light. And then hopefully at the end, I'm more than happy to participate in the questions. It's actually what I'm looking forward to, so thank you. Oh, that was just wonderful. Thank you, thank you so much. Really excited as well to introduce our next speaker, um, Dr. Mara Kelly. Dr. Kelly has been working in Bellingham for 10 years. In fact, in September, she celebrated her 10th anniversary. Dr. Kelly started in as what we would have a hybrid position. She was working, um, spending some time in our clinic as well as in the hospital. But about five years ago, she decided to move full time um, to be a hospitalist, which means she was caring for um, our patients while they were in the hospital um, and has had a leadership role um, at that time. Dr. Kelly, um, in terms of her leadership role, she is the lead of the pediatric hospitalists as well as the medical director for our pediatrics program um, for the entire Peace Health Northwest Network. Prior to coming to Peace Health, Dr. Kelly received her medical degree from the University of North Carolina School of Medicine and then did her pediatric residency at the University of Washington School of Medicine. Um, but prior to all of this, um, Mara worked in counseling and in social work and advocacy roles for nonprofit organizations who served at risk um, youth and families, including migrant families and children with special health care needs. Her most important job, though, is being the mom of two amazing school age children, and her family enjoys all the activities that the Pacific Northwest has to offer, um, enjoying all of our natural beauty, especially in skiing and backpacking and cycling. So welcome, Dr. Kelly, and I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you for that introduction, Anne. I appreciate it. And like Kayla, I really want to express my gratitude at the opportunity to talk to all of you today about all the work that we are doing. And as I was preparing for this, my one worry was whether I'd be able to hold back. We are very, very passionate in this work. And um, so I will be, I will try to pace myself. But I thought maybe the best way to sort of start our discussion to really think about the personal side of the of the where we are and where we want to go um, that Kayla was discussing is I'm actually going to be a little selfish and talk about what the role of a pediatric hospitalist is because I think it will give you a sense of what it means to have kids at St. Joe's. I still have some experiences sometimes where I walk down the hallway and start chatting with somebody at, at in the hospital and they say oh but we don't take care of kids in our hospital and we do and we do it well and but we definitely have an opportunity to continue to grow 
the ways that we care for them. So as a pediatric hospitalist, there's somebody 24 hours a day, seven days a week available to care for anybody under the age of 18 who comes to the hospital. And we really do have our finger on the pulse of most people who are in the hospital who fit in that age group. We take care of well newborns after they are born. We take care of um, our sicker and our premature babies in our special care nursery. We are the ones who are at the delivery with our resuscitation team to care for those babies who are in distress or who are expected to have complications at birth. But we also have a role in other parts of the hospital as well. We consult in the emergency department. We are stand by the side of the emergency department doctors for those most acute kids um, who are having true emergencies. And um, we also admit patients to the pediatric floor. And we're just sort of on standby for all questions about kids, whether they're in imaging or in the OR. Um, so it's a really wonderful opportunity to get a sense of the whole community that is within the hospital and really realize that kids touch every department. They might not touch them as much as adults do, but they're present in all of those places. So that kind of frames what it looks like to be a kid inside St. Joe's through our lens as the, as the doctors who care for them. And then I was thinking about stories. There's so many stories I could share about experiences that lack of access has um, impacted a, the experience of a family with our hospital or with the healthcare needs of their child. But I picked one that sort of sums up several of them and know that not everybody is, is touched this many times with issues with access, but many people are in, in some way. So the, this, the family I'd like to share with you is a, a family that I've actually come to know quite well through, my, through their experiences with our hospital. But three years ago, um, a 28-year-old mom was unexpectedly expecting twins. She'd had three other kiddos under the age of five and had all of her health care at that point through um, a family medicine doc in the community who also delivered her babies at St. Joe's without event because they were term babies. But her twin pregnancy got a little more complicated as they tend to do when she developed hypertension and gestational diabetes. And she established care with um, Peace Health OB, which provided that her a lovely high level of care. But at this time, we don't have maternal family medicine services here in Bellingham. So multiple times, this mama, whose husband, this is an important part of their story, but whose husband worked out of town and so was not able to be present for most of the pregnancy or the delivery. Um, so she was putting the kids in the minivan and going for these routine visits for her twins to get their, ultras their high risk ultrasounds done, have her diabetes managed. And it was a full day affair, as I'm sure you can imagine, putting a five-year-old, a three-year-old and a one-year-old in the minivan while you're pregnant with twins to go to these appointments. And, but the collaborative care was great. Um, her local OBs knew what the plan was and they work really closely with the UW MFM folks routinely. And then she went into preterm labor and her water broke. So she had to have her babies delivered at St. Joe's at 33 and two sevenths weeks. And as Kayla described, we take care of babies 34 weeks and up, not 32 weeks and up yet. And so because of that cutoff, those babies then had to be transported to another facility for their care. And they, um, one of them required CPAP, which if they'd been one week older, we can do um, with ease now in our special care nursery. And the other one required a little bit of a lower level of respiratory support, high flow, which is also something if they had just been five days older, we could have cared for them locally here. And so they both went down to the University of Washington in Seattle. And this poor, basically single mom, because her husband can't be there with her, now has three kids, two babies at, at the, in Seattle and trying to manage all that. And it used to be a decade ago when I first started here that routinely the University of Washington would send those kind of babies back to us for what they call convalescent care or to learn to feed and eat once the acute um, issues had passed. But with insurance and EMTALA and things like that, that's become more complicated for families. But thankfully, the folks at University of Washington made an exception and they waived the, the money to transport the babies back because after just 10 days, all they needed was feeding support. And this poor mom had three different family members caring for her three different kids while she was trying to stay with the baby. So to bring the babies back to us for them to be in our special care nursery and her to only be a 10 minute drive instead of an hour and a half drive from her family was really important. So we'll fast forward a little bit because the babies did great with us. They hung out one of them for another week and a half and the other one for two and a half weeks to learn to feed um, and be able to go home um, and feeding on their own and growing appropriately. And then as does happen sometimes, one of the babies um, developed RSV, 
that would got sick with RSV and um, which is a respiratory illness that in adults can cause a little cold and can be quite a bit more significant for babies, especially preterm babies. So I was at these babies' initial delivery, and then I got to care for them when they came back. And then I happened to be in the ER the day. I mean, I was the hospitalist on and met them in the ER when their little one was sick. And he was the issue with bronchiolitis and little babies is that they are doing well, and then they're suddenly not doing very well anymore. So this baby needed to be admitted for some um, oxygen and was working hard to breathe and working harder to breathe and then started to have some apneic spells. So we were able to use that high flow nasal cannula that we use in our special care nursery, but at the time we didn't, weren't able to do it on our peds floor. And so we had to start him on that. So then we had to transport him again to Seattle, again, separating this mom from her kiddos, having to figure out now with a newborn twin at home and one in Seattle, this dance that she had to do. And he had gorgeous care at Seattle and he did really well, although it did cause him to have a little bit more issues with his feeding and he took a big step back. So he actually went home with a nasogastric tube to get his feedings. But this mom had sort of dealt with this before in the nursery, so she was very capable. But the unfortunate thing is, is that she was really squeamish and she didn't want to put that NG tube back in for her babies. And so she kept having to come back to the emergency department because we didn't have another way for her to get her baby her baby's NG to put back in, hang out in the waiting room, and then take up a room in the ER to get that replaced. So that was the, the, our first uh, sort of six months with this family. Um, and the twins were thriving. And then come about, I think it was nine months ago, because it was during COVID, um, I was called to an urgent unexpected delivery for a baby who was 34 and 0, 07 weeks. And it was this, this mama again. Thankfully, the dad was at the bedside this time. And thankfully, that baby was 34 and 0, 07 weeks. So he was able to stay with us. Um, which was such a lovely experience for mom. And she expressed so much gratitude that she didn't have to do the travel. She didn't have to think about all the complicated issues. And amazingly for her, and maybe she just has really bad luck, but while her baby was with us in the special care nursery, her five-year-old developed periorbital cellulitis and had to get admitted. But we could care for him here also. So they were just a floor away. But because of COVID, she's like, you know, I'm going to sit by the bedside of my five-year-old because he's older and he's super scared. And I know that my baby is getting phenomenal care in the special care nursery because we've lived that experience before. So luckily we've not seen this family back to our hospital in the last nine months. So that means things are going well. But I think one of the really heartfelt things about our families with kids with special health care needs or with preemie babies is that we do see them with routine through our hospital. And it's very both heartwarming and heartbreaking when a family will say to me, oh, look, it's our hospital doctor because you really shouldn't have a primary hospital doctor, but we are there for them when they need. So um, that's my story that I wanted to share. And then Joanna, if you wanted to pull up the slide because I do talk fast and I apologize for that, but I thought maybe it would be a nice opportunity. And these are super wordy slides, but Kayla get, did a nice broad overview. And so I thought this might be the opportunity to see some of the details in which we're, we're talking about when we're talking about past state and current state and future state, where we really want to go. And so this is the um, neonatal levels of, um, of care standards. And the really exciting thing for us and all the work all the work that we have been doing to try to grow the care that we provide is that come September 2021, if this mom, that scenario I told you in the beginning with 33-week twins with um, RSV requiring high flow nasal cannula and with an NG tube, you have to go to the ER to replace, we would now, in, come September, we will be able to care for those babies in our nursery and not ship them. We And then if the baby got RSV and needed high flow nasal cannula on the floor, we rolled that out in October on our pediatric floor. So we'd be able to meet that need locally still. And now also a huge um, promise for our uh, community is last February, we opened an opportunity to have a space where pediatric patients can come in, get outpatient procedures and infusions, such as an NG tube, by a pediatric nurse with just a simple order from your doctor. And that mom could come in and out of that space without using ED time, without having to sit in an ED emergency department. So the really exciting thing is we're talking about our future, but we've done a lot just this year in the last two years to really get, get that experience for that family to look really different. And then if you don't mind showing the next slide, Joanna, that would be great. And then this is just an opportunity because we do um, we do talk about lots of obscure sorts of things, but I thought this was a nice and again very wordy slide. But if somebody was interested, where and on the pediatric floor, what kind of kids would, could we take care of? What are we? Where have we come to now? And where we're hoping to go in the future? 
And I did realize last night before I went to sleep, and it's interesting that Kayla brought it up, that the one that I did not put on here is the issue of our children in our community with mental and behavioral health crisis. Um, and there's been many articles in the New York Times and in NPR about this, and we live that here in Whatcom County. A third of our pediatric patients during the pandemic, because thankfully children have not been impacted by the disease of COVID like adults have, but they've been impacted by another huge crisis, which is isolation, depression, and um, limited resources because they're not having access to school. So a third of our patients we've cared for on our PEDS floor have been awaiting a disposition for safety because of behavioral mental health, and, and that we play a really important role in that as well. So I will, that, that's my, my, my physician and patient perspective. And like Kayla, I'm just looking forward to the opportunity to keep having a conversation and answering questions you guys may have. And that was wonderful, Dr. Kelly. Thank you so much. Your story really brings to life um, the importance of being able to care for the newest members of our community and their families. So if we go ahead and go to the next slide, I want to share with you um, and thank you um, for those who have helped um, support the foundation and our women's and children's program over the years. Um, some of the impacts specifically that you have made. One of the areas that I want to start off with too is um, we've talked a lot about how to be able to keep um, our newborns here when they arrive um, under 34 weeks. And, and one of the ways to do that is the foundation help supported um, what we what we call a giraffe omnibed. And that really is a special, special incubator. Um, that's an all-in-one piece of equipment really that helps us um, through various stages of care for a new infant. It minimizes the stress related to kind of a constantly changing environment, reduces excessive stimulation, and is really, really a game changer in being being able to keep um, our newest members um, here in Bellingham because the last thing we want to do is, is to cause um, additional burden by taking them away from their support system here locally. The other areas that the foundation um, has really been impactful with is has everything from bassinets to infant warmers to portable ultrasounds. We also have a really special program that was made possible through the Julie McPhee Memorial, Memorial Childbirth Center book program. And we get to give a book to every child um, who is born at our childbirth center. Over 2,000 um, are dis distributed annually, and we're so thankful for Julie um, and that we're able to carry out her legacy in this very special way. In terms of supporting our pediatrics, um, we've done a lot of work for our pediatrics within our clinics. Um, everything um, from mini Dopplers to jaundice meters to Billy Light systems, you name it, um, we've really been able to support um, that program. And then we also have a program um, called Reach Out and Read, which provides a book for every child when they have a wellness visit um, at our pediatrics clinic. So if we go ahead um, and just say again, a big thank you um, to all of those who have supported the foundation and the work of the amazing clinical team. So I wanna really now just open it up for questions. Um, if those of you that have questions, we've already had a few submitted, um, so I can, I can definitely um, respond to those as well. You can either raise your hand, interrupt me, or put a question um, in the chat function. So we're gonna definitely now open it up um, to Q&A and I'm actually gonna start um, with uh, a great question. Um, and Dr. Kelly, I will direct this to you and this was a question that was submitted. Um, the question is what can or cannot peace health physicians do relating to women's reproductive health? Yes, yeah, so um, I'm glad that somebody submitted that question in advance because an OB would be able to just name them off. And, and so I just needed a little support. So I got some support from some friends. So when it comes to reproductive health, and this definitely applies for pediatricians in our conversations with adolescents as well. Um, I think the overarching principle is that the privacy of the patient and the physician is respected. So we are allowed to have conversations with our patients about the full spectrum of reproductive health services, um, including birth control, including termination of pregnancy, um, including um, sterilization when you feel like you are done having children. Um, and that is open for us to be able to have those conversations with our families and we are and with our patients and we're not restricted in any way for that. Um, and other than the pregnancy termination, we do the full scope of care within Peace Health as well. Um, women often 
will do sort of the one two punch of I'm having my C-section. I'd love to have my tubes tied. And that's the conversation they have with their outpatient with their OB prior to the delivery and consents get done prior to that. But um, but that is a, 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 a that is care that we provide routinely for our uh, our moms and um, not the sterilization part, but the birth control part for our adolescent teens as well. Thank you so much. Do you feel like that answered the question, Anne? It did okay, wonderfully. Great. Thank you so much. Um, another question that I received is, and we've touched on this a little bit, but little just more of an expansion on how has COVID-19 affected um, our women's and children's programs, um, specifically at the medical center? Well, I could start that conversation then I'll let Sounds Kayla good. jump in. Um, so it's kind of this, I don't know about everyone else. I think we've all been feeling a lot of feels this past week with the year anniversary and sort of where were we when it started. And as a physician, it's phenomenal to, phenomenal to me how much we know um, also to be fully immunized. And a year after a disease is found is just remarkable. But um, so in the beginning, it was really challenging, especially, I mean, for all, but for us with in pediatrics, we were really concerned because most infectious diseases impact children and particularly newborns in a much greater way. And a year later, I am thrilled to say that that is not the case, um, that children and newborns have been relatively protected um, overall. But so so how it's affected our care is that we have had to do a lot of thinking, a lot of growing, a lot of being nimble and changing a lot because the recommendations were always changing about how we manage moms who are COVID positive, um, either asymptomatic or symptomatic in while they're delivering their baby. So we can make sure that the baby and the care team are safe. Um, how we how we manage the care of that newborn. In the beginning, the policy was that they should all be separated from their mom because that's what they were doing in China and that's how they knew that kids were staying safe. And that was really hard. Pediatricians hate to take babies from their parents, from their mom. And luckily we've evolved past that and we do not have to do that anymore. But we've had to really consider and change our policies uh, quite a, quite often. Um, and then the other piece from a pediatric standpoint, we talked about the mental health part of it for sure, but we also had to be really thoughtful about how and where we were going to care for kids. Um, St. Joe's has developed a phenomenal COVID unit up on, in the ICU where adults are cared for, but that's not a great place to put a four-year-old who's COVID positive. And we also know that people can be asymptomatic, so you may be hospitalized for something different that does, has nothing to do with your COVID. So again, with some being nimble and researching and thoughtful, we have we've created a pediatric toolkit where we're able to care for those kids still on our peds floor and not overburdened children's the first inclination like just send all the kids there didn't seem like a good use of resource so um that is and that is the ways that we've had to think through policies and procedures and safety and then i would say families would tell you the biggest impact of covid for their experience at st joe's is about visitation and we've also tried to be really flexible with that as we can. As the numbers go down in our community, we were able to add not just one support person, but two to um, who could be present at a birth. And we have been really passionate and from the pediatric standpoint that both parents need to be engaged in the care of their baby who's in the special care nursery. And both parents need to be present if they have a medically complicated child who's um, admitted or a child less than one, because we know the ideal, right? If there's two parents who are actively engaged in the care of their little one, we don't want to isolate one of them from that experience. Kayla, do you have any other thoughts other than visitation and policies? Yes, uh, I wanna add to that that this also gave us an opportunity to work with our community in a different way. One of the things that we found was a, a big fear initially to even coming to the hospital to deliver. And so I actually want to commend our team because we called every mother that was expected to deliver with us to really have conversations and meet them where they were at with respect to their concerns. Uh, because in managing healthcare during a pandemic, you know, now we were seeing, okay, we're seeing um, people opting not to come in, not just for the delivery, but also where traditionally they would come to our special obstetric ED where things didn't feel right. People were waiting to get this because there was this real fear of if I come into this setting, will I be exposed? And so when you think about how things were a year ago, where where we are at now, where they feel comfortable, they feel protected. The toolkits that uh, Dr. Kelly referred to, we actually developed specialty ones, not just for the P sides, but also how we're managing um, the 
pregnant individual coming in to us, how we're going to manage the labor, the postpartum care, all of this, and keep them as much as we can within the women and children centric environment, which was the key. Right? How much can you move the cheese um, and still stay effective was really something that was in the back of our minds. And so it, it's been great, but it was a lot of, of, of pivoting and really taking the time to address people's concerns because just that one person could be communicating throughout and it would just, you know, create a storm. So. And, and I guess the one other thing I would want to point out, because I think it was another real success that we came, that came out of the pandemic, is that also in this time of trying to think about, I mean, Kayla's right, so much fear and concern that we were also having to worry about a mom who didn't want to take their child, their brand newborn baby for a follow-up visit in a clinic where there could be sick kids or sick adults. Um, and so with that um, partnership with our clinic and, and big props to Chris Gajero, the manager of the um, clinic, the Peds Clinic, we were able to create what we now call our newborn clinic. And our newborn clinic is rather than seeing your primary care provider, there's a new, uh, doc every day who's assigned to newborns in a space a little separate from the rest of the clinic. The patients don't go through the waiting room and they just see well newborns until there's not any well newborns to see. Um, and what was amazing about that is by bringing all the newborns together, we could be finally find a way to bring, oh, right, it used to be lactation lived in obstetrics, but now they come over to peds because every, every other baby needs to be seen in that time frame. And now we're doing hearing screen in the clinic. And now the nurses are able to do billy draws without sending babies down to the to the lab and those opportunities are such a great talk about that one-stop shop that poor mama who used to have to go all these places with these newborns now just go one spot and the other thing I was really proud of and with the service line we think about it often is that every as a pediatric hospitalist every kid in the community could be my patient and so we were really mindful not to say this is only a service offered for peace health patients because all the clinics were looking at the same struggles so for a, a period of about four months while people are getting their feet under them we provide to care for the um, the patient, the newborns from the Lummi Clinic and the Nooksack Clinic and CMAR Clinic. While they were trying to figure out what's the best way to get newborns in safely, we opened opened up our doors and were able to care for those newborns in that clinic as well, which has been a great success. And it's interesting that pediatricians want their newborns back and the parents don't want it. They have really, all the feedback we've gotten from moms is that that experience is one that should continue on. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you guys for that insight. And I love hearing about the collaboration with our larger community here in Whatcom County. That's just, it's phenomenal. I want to pause for a minute and ask if there's any questions from the group. You can either enter in the chat function or vocally ask a question. I think I gave it the awkward pause long enough. I'll ask one more question, um, final question um, that was submitted. And, and that's um, really about what makes our childbirth center, we've kind of talked about it, but are there any services um, that make us, that set us apart um, from others when you compare our childbirth center and PDX programs to other across the country? Um, Kayla, I'll start with you. Um, and then Dr. Kelly, if you want to add anything in. So I think one thing that really sets us apart is the dedication of the team, right? You can have all the bells and whistles, but ultimately it's how you reach your patients. And when I shared uh, some of the things that we want to improve upon, like the, the facility, the printout, the, you know, the layout, all, all these things that we want to do to enhance the care, the one thing that has sustained us throughout is that excellence drives it the connection to the patients are there and there's a, a grace that our community gives us because of the experience that we provide. And, and this is Evelyn, I have a question about uh, what I do remember is the hospital worked with Western Speech and Hearing Clinic to do the testing when on newborns as to the hearing. Is that still occurring or, or what? We actually do have, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. So we we contract Evelyn now. Um, Western uh, several years ago were in, not interested in continuing to um, do the newborn piece. They wanted they do to continue to provide really important resources and hearing screening for um, for children and um, 
and babies in our community once they are outside that newborn period of time. But we contract with a company called Pediatrics that does a lot of the hearing screens across um, the state of Washington. So there's hearing screeners present every day. And then the hearing screen device that is at the pediatric clinic that um, I do believe there may be an ask to the foundation for that. The, the current use of that is actually to be able to do the follow up newborn screens on the babies who we call it deferred. We never say they fail in the first couple of days of life. We say they deferred because they did not pass the test. Um, and because pediatrics in the past would bring those babies back to the hospital to do those repeat screens. And with the safety we have in our newborn clinic, we did not feel like we wanted to bring babies back to the hospital just for a hearing screen. So I hope that answers your question. We we still definitely pediatricians rely on Western for older kids and babies who have formally failed their newborn screen. And this newborn, and these are true newborn hearing screens that we're talking about. Good, thank you. You look wonderful. And I guess I just had one quick thing to share about what makes us unique. And I think that many places um, also put this at the forefront, but we are <laughs> we're recognized in the system as being very um, earnest and evidence-based, but we um, also very, very much put the patient and the family in the center of all of our conversations. Um, Family-friendly, everything is just really our philosophy when it comes to what we do in the childbirth center and in pediatrics, whether that's a family-friendly C-section where moms can see their babies be born if they want to, and we don't just bring them to the doc or the nurse just because if they look well, they go to their mom first. I have experiences routinely where we have residents from children's who um, come work with us in the hospital and they are dumbfounded as we're starting our resuscitation efforts on babies on their mother rather than separating them from their mom and bringing them over. And so those opportunities are um, really meaningful for families and really important for the babies and the patients that um, children need their parents and so the, to include them in the caregiving team is essential. Love hearing that overarching philosophy. That's just wonderful. Our and final question. Can I add something to oh. that, Anne? And, and one of the things to say that is when we talk about family, we know that that definition has evolved throughout time. And we, we think about what separates this team is actually being able to lean into that. I can't tell you the amount of um, families that would be considered non traditional, but are now. Uh, the norm that we've been able to meet and excel and, and address the concerns of will we be treated in an equitable fashion? Will our needs be met because we don't present in the traditional way? And I would say that this team does a phenomenal uh, job of that from before they even land here. And I say that literally because we have people that come from outside of the country uh, to deliver with us to all the way throughout. Thank you. It makes me proud to work at Peace Health. Our final question today, we're going to take um, from the chat, and Kayla, we'll start with you on this one. We understand that we have some space limitations, and, and what are those limitations? What does that impact on our caregivers that are working in our medical center? It's funny because I was thinking, oh, Dr. Kelly would love to speak. Oh, no, Dr. Kelly, you can go like first, Dr. Kelly, if you because want. She lives it on a daily basis when she has to take care of patients in um and i you know what first came to mind for me is like our special care nursery and our obstetrical ed setup and all those others where we actually it's what we're able to do with the footprint that we have is phenomenal when you think about the current standards and so i'm going to pass it over to dr kelly because she can speak to that piece real life in all right. detail yes. <laughs> Yeah, well, thanks for the question, and it is an important one, and I think there's um, two answers because there's two different sort of issues, and I will try to be succinct. So, yes, our childbirth center is space limited, and we um, there's an amazing picture a nurse took of me once while we were getting ready for a C-section of twins where I had to take my phone and my pager off and hand it one to each RT because I couldn't, um, there was not enough room for them to fit with me in between the warmers where the babies were going to to go. So we really do, we are all up close and very personal during our resuscitations. And yes, our patients little, but our space is even smaller. So, um, and one time Seattle Children's, one of the neonatologists came to visit us who works with us a lot, but had never seen the space. And she was like, oh, 
I'm going to use the phrase cute <laughs> because she could not believe the incredible care that we were providing and sending these babies her way in our tight space. So our space is small. I always tell parents that it is um, we provide high tech quality care in, in a petite space. And then our issue for pediatrics is a little different. I think one of the reasons why our patients, our perception is we don't take care of pediatrics is because we don't have a dedicated pediatric unit. And our patients are on a medical surgical floor with, I always warn parents, if you see a little old lady walking in a walker, she's not lost, she's probably your neighbor and she's supposed to be there. She won't be in your room with you, but she is your neighbor. And it's so a very mixed floor. And so certainly an opportunity as we're looking towards a new facility to have our pediatric, our women and our children cohorted in the same space with ample space for the kind of care we provide would be wonderful. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Well. Our time um, together has gone so quickly um, and it is up now. So I just want to um, kind of close us out today and thank you all uh, for being a part of this conversation. Thank you to our amazing presenters today. We are so blessed to have the two of you um, in our community um, and carrying out the mission of Peace Health. We will be sending out a survey after this event. Please take a few minutes. We really value your feedback um, as we continue um, to continually improve on um, bringing these virtual events to you. And I'm hopeful that we'll one day be together um, in person um, with the opportunity to, to share the amazing work that is happening at St. Joe's. So with that, I will wish you all a wonderful, um, wonderful rest of the day and a great week and take care everyone. Thanks again for joining. Bye everyone.